this year's flying by. And uh, from what I've been told, it's, uh, we're about to have another addition to the family. Lord willing, at the end of the year, it's just going to get even faster. So I'm, I'm greatly looking forward to that. Thank you for the invitation to be here. Always happy to come home and preach the gospel. Whenever Gary told me about this, it was last year, they said they wanted me to come back and they, you know, that was my cue to go ahead and start thinking about what I would want to preach. I, I had no clue. So it, it took me some time. And for the adult class this morning, we want to have a discussion on how can I become more spiritually passionate? How can I become more, and we're going we're gonna to use the phrase or coin the phrase on fire for God today. There, there's a lot of ways. We can say, well, get more involved at your local congregation. Uh, reach out. Uh, kind of follow the, the steps, if you will, of James 1 and 27. Uh, pure religion on, and, and the steps of what follows. There, there's ways we can do it. But I want to look, and these next lessons over the period of these two days, we're going to be looking at us as individuals and what we can do individually to increase my spiritual passion. Because whether you're at a congregation that has elders and deacons, or maybe you don't have that established yet, or maybe you won't have it established, we can't always be looking to other individuals to make me smarter, to make me do more, to make me care more about the gospel and the members. So i, I, I got to know what I can do. Uh, German philosopher Greg Friedrich Hegel said, nothing great in this world can be accomplished without passion. You and I are trying to go out into the world, evangelize, preach the gospel, and help bring souls to Christ. So we must have passion in these efforts. God wants Christians to be fervent in spirit. You'll notice there in Romans 12 at verse 11, the Bible reads for individuals not to be slothful in their business, fervent in spirit serving the Lord. Zealous of good works. Looking there at our primary text, if you go back and you see there in uh, Titus chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. Uh, in Titus 2 at verse 14, the Bible is going to read talking about Christ, that He gave Himself for us, that He might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto Himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. That's the, that's the idea. How can I become more zealous? Where can I get more zeal? We read in the scriptures of there's individuals that the Bible mentions by name that had a record of zeal but not according to knowledge. So I know that my passion and my love for God and His church and the work can be incorrect. So how can I make sure that what I'm doing today is correct? Because let's be honest, friends. The Christian life, the most important thing, the most important job for my soul. If I'm not doing something right, that means my soul's in jeopardy, and I'll, 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 I'll want to go to heaven. If you notice there in John 2, at verse 17, the Bible records Jesus as be, being, another one of those phrases, eaten up with passion for God. The Bible reads, and his disciples remembered that is written, written, the Bible says, thy zeal, or the zeal of thine house has eaten me up. There's a care and a passion that was inside of Christ for the work, enough so that, as we see there in Matthew 26, the moments before his crucifixion and death, and Matthew 27, his death, we, we see just how much he cared, how much he loved the work. Apollos, Acts 18, and verse 25, it's told that he was serving the Lord, he was fervent in spirit, and because of that, the Bible reads it, and it says he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord, knowing only the baptism of John. And once again, another one of those accounts where we have individuals fervent in spirit doing something, but in Acts, Acts the 18th chapter, verse 25, the baptism of John was no longer valid. So we have a zeal. He's doing it right, but he's just not quite all right. So we've got to make sure that we, we address that. 2 Corinthians 9, verse 2. The Bible reads, For I know thy forwardness of mind, which, of which I boast of them to you in Macedonia and Achaia, was ready to depart a year ago. Your zeal has provoked very many. Friends, our passion and our love for God can be that bright and shining light. Matthew 5, verse 16, that the world and you know, the members need to see. Uh, it's a whole lot easier to work whenever there's other people working and there's other people that care about it. But whenever the care and the love is just simply not there, you just want to go home. You don't, you don't want to do anything. 
So that's what we're looking at. That was a brief intro. Number one, what can I do? Now, uh, Gary, what time did I stop? 25 after. We will not make it through all 10 points. Just go ahead and throw that out there. I'll just go ahead and throw that out there. If you want the 10 points, I can flip through them so you can at least jot them down uh, at the, at near the end. But number one, what can I do to increase my spiritual passion? Look up and evaluate my relationship with God. If, if, if there's one thing that needs to be addressed, it's how well or, or how good of a relationship you have with God. Uh, you, you, you're having trouble in your marriage. Who do you go to? Well, ultimately, hopefully, you go to God, but you go to your wife or your husband and say, we got some problems, we need to address it. You have a relationship problem with your kids. Who do you go to to talk to about it? You go to your kids. You go to the source of the relationship and, and you try to fix and evaluate the problem. You and I today, we got to start where the relationship is, and that's with God. Well, the question is, well, Lee, what, what if it's not with God? Well, there's your first problem. And you got to see, do you love God or the world more? If the answer is God, Ask yourself, what am I most passionate about? Philippians 3, Paul talking to the church of Philippi. He says, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. Who's he talking about? He's talking about himself. Uh, before, obviously, Paul was Saul, he says, whenever I was in all this, there wasn't one who loved and cared more. We see those accounts in Acts 6, Acts 7, Acts 8, and then the, the, the transformation there in Acts chapter 9. We see the truth behind that. Am I satisfied with my passion for God as it stands right now? Friends, I don't believe we can answer the answer to that question. I put it up there just to get you thinking this morning. I can't be satisfied with my relationship with God. Uh, I, I'm under the impression, and I, I, I'm not forcing this on you this morning, I'm under the impression it can never be good enough. My relationship with God can be good to get me into heaven, but it can always be better. Can I be doing more? Absolutely. Can I show more love towards God and the brethren? Amen. So is my passion good enough as it stands right now? No. Can it get better? Why would I not want it to? Uh, you, you go to the next one. Can we honestly be satisfied with okay? My relationship, it's okay. How, how's the marriage at home, John? Okay. I have the kids. They're okay. Could be doing better. I, whenever I hear it's okay, could be better, could be worse. It's not good enough whenever it comes to something as serious as my relationship with God. I want it to be better. It, 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 for me, it cannot get worse. John, can you? You can't lose your wife, can you? She's everything you got. I, I'm going to speak for you. I know it is. So if, if things cannot get better in your mind, or worse in your mind, it has to get better. It must get better. If we look there, and we're not going to go to Revelation 3, but we'll see if we look there. Uh, what needs to change so that God becomes my greatest passion? This is an open class, so feel free to speak up if you have a thought. But what needs to change? My direction. My love. My goal. What do you hope to achieve in this life? Some of you have already got the marriage of 20, 30 plus years. Well done. Some of you already got good group, good family, good group of kids, got some grandkids, maybe some great grandkids. Not showing your age, huh? But what else you need? I ain't worried about the job. I ain't worried about none of that. I, I thing on my plate is my relationship with God, my soul. Where's it going? How's it doing? Can I do better? And there's no, there's no option of it is going to get worse. It's not, it's not. A, that's not in the plans. Number two, go back, stand under the cross. Maybe I'm just not in it enough. Go back to Calvary. Get back in. There, there's no other account scripturally in the Bible. Whenever you take Matthew 26, Matthew 27, take Hebrews chapter 1 and chapter 2, see what Christ left, see what he done, see what he endured. There's nothing that humbles me and brings me back to the origin of why I'm doing it. It's because of what was done for me first. Hebrews 2 and verse 9, what does it say? I, I'll start it for you if you finish it for me. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the end. Somebody finish. You can turn there and read it. Somebody turn to Hebrews chapter 2, read verse 9 for you. But we see, but we see Jesus. 
who is made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. That's it. Where the, my passion isn't good enough. Go back and look what Christ done. Go, go back and look at the source of true love, John 3, verse 16. See what Christ left behind for mankind. And John, read it one more time. You're going to notice a few key things. Go ahead. But we, but we see Jesus, who, made a, who was made a little lower than the angels. He left heaven. The suffering and death. The reason. Crowned, he left heaven. Crowned. Suffering and death. And he was crowned with glory and honor. That he, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. He left heaven, made lower than the things he created for you and I to fulfill God's plan to die on the cross. So that we might have salvation. John 12 at, at, at verse 32. Let's, let's turn over there just real quick this morning. Many of us probably know it, but we'll we'll turn there just to read. John 12 and verse 32. Why go back to the cross? What's the significance? Notice what Christ said about the power of the cross and what he was going to do with it. Uh, John 12 and verse 32. He says, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. The significance of it. Why, why go back? I'm looking at how to rekindle the fire of my relationship for God and my love for the Word. Why go back to the cross? Because for you and I today, that's where New Testament Christianity started. We see the fulfillment of the prophecies in Acts 1 and Acts 2, but this is where it was for us. Without the cross of Calvary, you and I have nothing today. So with the cross of Calvary, that's where I go back and I see it. Uh, C.S. Lewis said Christianity, if false, is of no importance. And if true, it is of infinite importance. The only thing Christianity cannot be is moderately important. What does that mean? You either care or you don't. Which you want? Which you want? There's none of that. The, the whole, oh, I'm straddling the fence right now. You're, you're not in. Because once you're in, you don't get out. And well, what about the people that fell away? Well, the Bible would argue that they were never in to begin with. The, the passion, the love, the care has to be there, friends. Because it is of most infinite importance. It, it was at the cross that we fell in love with the one who loved us enough to die so that we might live. It is also at the cross that we regain the passion by reliving the sins of Jesus' this final week. Going back and seeing what he done and he endured for me really puts it in perspective of what I can do for him. Number three. Uh, project yourself forward to the judgment. And this one may not make sense. How can I increase my spiritual passion? Look towards the end. You ever, you ever been working on something and you, you, it's just taking so long and you're just trying to keep in your mind that end goal, that end picture? Now, you ever do that with That work ever just get tiresome and... Uh, repetitive, and you're like, just remember at the end, man, it gets done and we get a paycheck. That's my end goal with work, unless it's housework or honey-do list work, but there's no paycheck at the end of that. So that, that's even tougher than it. But project yourself forward and look towards the end. Why are you a Christian, John? Where do you want to get with it? What do you want out of it? Gary? Same thing? Ron? Down. Yeah. Down. We can go ahead and touch somebody with me. That's it. Yeah. In, in that, in and of itself, though there's a lot that's in there, should be enough to keep my passion where it is. However, whether you've seen people kind of burn out with jobs, you've seen marriages and families burn out because people seem to get stagnant and stale, look at the end goal. What do you want out of Christianity? Friends, I want what it offers. I want salvation. I want the crown of righteousness. You ever heard the old hymn, A Mansion, A Robe, and a Crown? Mm -hmm. Oh, man, if you have it, go look it up. Acapella. It's beautiful. But that's what it is. He says, I, I, I want my mansion, my robe, and my crown. 
Well, the mansion that's promised John 14, the robe that's, pro that's shown Isaiah 1 to be washed in the blood of Christ, and what? The crown of righteousness, Revelation 2 verse 10. I want those things. Well, Paul wrote to Jesus, Colossians 1 verse 28, whom we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. And we know the sense of perfect there in Colossians as it is in many places in the Scriptures talks about the idea of complete or whole. This is, this is the establishing of, of myself. Looking forward to judgment. We're making pretty good time, but we're about to slow down. Number, number four, look inside and re-examine your motives. To sustain for the long haul, each Christian must pay attention to two things. And this is where we're going to slow down because we got to do some talking. Purpose and passion. So far, all this morning, we've talked about passion, right? We, we need to look at purpose. Purpose has to do with our head. Education plus thinking right about what God commands and expects. <coughs> passion has to do with the heart. Does it sound like a Bible verse yet? Somebody turn your Bibles to Mark chapter 12. Tell me if you can find the verse in that chapter that we're talking about. I better turn there and make sure I'm thinking of the right verse. Because <laughs> I always get this one confused with another one. Yep. Mark 12. Somebody read verse 30. Any means, he himself should become a castaway. Right? Yeah. 
Keep them safe, them cheap. Do we do that today? Should be. The body is the temple yeah. now, right? So that means that we have an obligation to take care of our body, but to also use it for His purpose, not not just to you know. I'm going to do what I do at Union Grove. Prove it. Prove, prove it with the scripture. What you just said. There's one verse that will, that will summarize what everybody just said. Second Corinthians 2. That, that'll work a little bit. There's another one. Give me another one. Go to Romans 12. Look at verse 1. Romans 12 and 1. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your there it is, reasonable service. The, the presenting of our bodies, the understanding the body is a temple, and understanding with this life, whether it be physical and the spiritual side of it, I'm, I am to serve God with it, because watch, I like the last two words, it's your reasonable service. It's your due diligence. It's, it's what's required of you to inherit what's promised to you. It, maybe, you ever known somebody do something good for the wrong reason? Yeah. There's people like that in the world all, all around. Help people out just to, you know, double back and stab them in the back, right? Why? And this isn't a this is a rhetorical question. Just to get you thinking. Why are you? living the Christian life you're living today. Is it true love and everything that it entitles? Or is it because somebody else is forcing you to do it? Those are two really big motivators, friend. You know, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. There's proper motives and both of these lists can grow much longer. You, you can definitely write these down and I encourage you if you're taking notes to write them down and then to turn back and maybe add some things to them. But proper motives. Love the Lord, love the Bible, love the law. That's why I serve God. I love Him because of what He's done for me. And, and the fact that He sent His Son down here to die on the cross for me. That He established through His Son a way of salvation. Open and free to all. 1 John 2, 1 and 2. And through that I have the opportunity of Forgiven life and an eternal life someday. I love the Bible. What does Psalms 119 97 say? Oh, how I love thy law. It is my meditation all the day long. Hmm. You ever love something so much that all you do is think about it? Give me, give me something outside of, outside of God that you just you love in your life, that you think about all the time. Family. Family. All right. Well, nobody thinks about food like I do. <laughs> I, mean, I thought for sure with some of the cooking that goes around here, y'all be like, well, not putting it ahead of nothing, but food's up. <laughs> it's on my list. I, you make your own list, but food's on my list. I think about it all the time. I'm, I'm a big old boy and I like to eat. End of the day, you know, don't judge me. <laughs> But family, up there for sure. Food. You ever think, you know, those of you that have kids, you ever think about just silence and, and look forward to it? <laughs> Man, you're like, Ollie, you don't even know. You just got one. I got another one coming and I got a dog now. So silence is golden. Okay? And my wife, I think she finally got her first taste of it the other day. Give you a funny story while you're probably still taking notes a little bit. Uh, Little one, he doesn't want to stay at his grandma's and grandpa's no more. He wants to come home with mommy's home. That's fine. We can all bring him home. Well, she seen him to spend the night. We were just going to really just go to bed. <laughs> didn't have no plans. Didn't want to plan nothing. We wanted to eat, clean up, go to bed. And that's what we done. Well, that's what she done. I don't, I don't sleep much. But uh, she goes, you hear that? And I was like, what is it? She goes, nothing. I said, I know. She said, is this why you stay up late at night? I said, it's one of the many reasons. Yeah. I said, but y'all fall asleep. They go to bed at 7.30, 8 o'clock. Fast time. All right? They in bed, they sleep by 8.39. I'm, I'm still going. You know? So the silence that just overtakes the house. Oh, it's beautiful. I think about it. I look forward to it. Because it's where I can think. It's where I can 
you know, if I need that time, this, you know, yesterday was rough. If I need that time, that's my time I, I can really devote and dedicate to God. It may not be the best time, but it's the time I got. It's the time I'm, I'm giving right now. That, that's a moment, friend. What, what I'm thinking about, what's on my mind. I love the Lord. I love His Word. And frankly, I love the law. Now, we, we're just going to go ahead and say the obvious just to get it out there so nobody misunderstands. I don't love the sin the lost are doing. We know that. But I love the people. I love the soul. I want to help in any way that I can. And I believe that to be a very uh, common understanding of individuals today, but I don't believe it to be an application of many people today. You know, it's very easy to say, well, I care about it. It's a lot harder to... Show that care, right? What do they say about love? Love known is... Love known is... Say love, you Love shown. Love shown. You, you care about it? Show it. Prove it. You know, words can carry a lot, and they can also just be empty in and of themselves. So if I'm going to profess a love for the lost, the next question is, what are you doing for the lost? You evangelize them? You're inviting them to the church. You know, sometimes it's hard to evangelize in certain scenarios. So maybe just a simple invitation to church will suffice for this moment. Are, are we doing that, please? Are we, are we sharing the news? The, I, I will stress this point until I'm no longer able to preach the gospel. The social media, the tool that no one is using today. I understand there's a great generation that doesn't use it. That's fine. Those people use telephones and they read the paper. So keep using that avenue. But the generations that use social media, if you're not using that avenue, you're missing a really good work to be done with it. I, I've noticed y'all picked up YouTube. Well done. I wanted to applaud y'all on that. Your YouTube channel, it may not be big right now, but you got some good stuff on there, primarily under the name we talk. So, but, <laughs> <laughs> but in all seriousness, good work. YouTube is next to and in a close race with Instagram. YouTube is the number one social media outlet used across the world. You got your foot in the door. Don't take it out. Keep using it. I know just about everybody here that simply cares. Uh, some of you just don't care, and that's fine. I don't care either. But Facebook, you got to use it. You don't have it, don't get it. <laughs> But why you have it? Use the avenues. Use the opportunities, friends. They're, they're great tools. Because you should love the lost. Improper reasons to serve God. This primarily refers to evangelists. Money. I don't care. Yeah. Should, does a preacher or an evangelist deserve a, a reward or payment for their work? Absolutely. I agree with that. And you said, well, Lee, you kind of got to this job. But at the end of the day, if I didn't get paid to do it, I'd have to find another job to support my family. I'd still do it. Why? Money is not a problem. Brethren will take care of it. Brethren don't take care of it. You know who will take care of it? Good Lord will take care of it. The Bible says so. We, we go on. We look. I'm not trying to gain my own glory. Me getting a popular name and you know growing and going, it's not of importance. I want the gospel to do that. Let your lights so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify who? Your Father which is in heaven. Prestige. Almost following along the same lines as the Lord. And this last one is kind of a joke, right? Easy living with Christianity. Do they go together? A lot of times they don't. Best living, Dad. For yeah. sure. Best living, Christianity. Yes. Best life to live. Easiest? No. If you get in it early, I think it's easier. If you wait... Oh, you're making it a lot tougher on yourself. Because what are we doing? We're developing a life around something that we shouldn't be a part of to begin with. Romans 12 and 2 now. And now I'm trying to change that. Sometimes that comes with a career change, friend change, living change. Sometimes you realize that the spouse that you're with, you're, biblically you're not even allowed to be with them. So now you've got to cross that hurdle and it must be crossed. Number five. Look above as you offer your worship. Friends, this this is one, and this might just be a pet peeve of Lee, and if it is, you can label it as that, pay no mind to it. But we need to be more vocal. It would really do. Have we, or do we ever, say amen to every prayer? Agree? What was
was just saying, the prayers for the sick, the lost, the families, the loved ones, the church, the word, the evangelist. Do you agree? Express it. We move on, sing louder. Where do we go to prove we need to sing? Ephesians 5, 19, Colossians 3, 16, right? Making melody in your heart, praising God. You know those of the Jewish age, if you go back and you look at some of the works of Josephus and some of the older writings, as they were going to worship, you know what they were doing? They were singing. They were, it was almost in, in unison. They were praying, they were singing, they were chanting, they were, they were worshiping God, showing them love. Oh, I apologize. Whenever we... Whenever they got the worship, you know what they done? They sung. This is an avenue for me to communicate with God how much I care, how much I appreciate, and how much I love. If you're not singing, you're not doing that. Oh, what a disappointment. You know, well, I can't carry a tune in the bucket. You know what, Gary, you know what I tell them? Join the crowd. There's a lot of us that can't carry a tune in the bucket. It, it don't matter. Exactly. That's the point we're trying to make. We go on. You know, are we, do we think more about others disapproving than of God approving of what we're doing? I believe so. Does it matter here? Who, in this life, who am I trying to please? God. What does Paul say to the church of Galatia there in Galatians 1 and verse 10? He asked them a, a, about two or three questions. Or am I now seeking the favor of men or of God? Or am I striving to please men? If I were still pleasing men, I should not be a servant of Christ. Puts it in perspective. It gets you thinking. Are you here to serve man or God? If you're here to serve men, you're certainly not serving God. Friends, the world already doesn't like it. Me being a part of it more and more isn't going to change anything other than their hate for it. And maybe, and there's a great potential in it that they see that as that light that we've talked about all, all lesson, and, the, and they go to make the change. Number six. Galatians 6, go ahead. Yeah. Our Galatians 1, verse 6, he said that verse 10, he said, I marvel. Now he got their attention. Mm -hmm. I, I'm not, I disapprove of this, somebody. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that calls you into the grace of Christ unto another gospel. And then he goes on and tells them that not one. That's it. And then he brings up the question, you know, who are you trying to convince? Who are you trying to please? Man or God? They actually also said, I believe in Galatians, that we're a peculiar people, zealous and good works. You know, we don't run with the crowd. We, we run for God. Right. Right? We're, we're, we're definitely here. We're sanctified. We're set apart from the rest. And that's how we are to conduct our lives, for sure. Number six, part A. Uh, okay, number six. Uh, get rid of all our pet scenes. Your, your passion is burning out. If there's a pet scene in your life, get rid of it. There, there's your problem. All right. it, it, it's that simple. My water bill went up. What did I have? What did I have? Went up significantly. I believe. Well, how do I get my water bill down? Fix the problem, right? Guilt, by definition, robs an individual of their passion. David said, My iniquities are going over my head and are as heavy as burden. They're too heavy for me. The psalmist says, following that in verse 6, still David, he says, I'm troubled. I'm bowed down greatly. I go mourning all the day long. What was David's problem? Seen. Get rid of it. Moving on. Uh, and, you know, we, 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 we see some similarities there. I just want to give you the, the next three points uh, just to finish out the last time I had time. Uh, number seven, uh, cultivate an active prayer life. Friends, number seven is the key to it all. Uh, if you do not have an active prayer life, you're missing out on something that can be very beneficial to your spirituality. Fix your prayer life. You don't have one, get one. You had one, lost it, get it back. That's it. Number eight, listen to powerful sermons. <clears throat> Something that will help an individual stay on the right path is staying in the gospel. Turn off the trash, turn on the work. Get off that ear candy. That's it. You know, I, I like a good movie just as much as the next guy, if not a little more. 
I like a good TV series that I can just binge watch. Anybody do that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know some of you do. Some of you, some of you like, I ain't got time to do that. That's fine. Turn it off. At the end of the day, it's not worth it. Learn more about the God. Number nine. Open up the Bible and read for personal profit. Study to show thyself approved unto God, work in the need not to be ashamed, rather than by the word of truth. Hebrews 5, developing and gaining from the milk of the word to the meat of the gospel. Friends, that's the goal. The only way I can do that personally is if I start growing and studying myself. As it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but out of every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. Number 10, if you're ready for it. Are we ready? Yeah, we're ready. No, take it. Number 10, teach personal Bible studies. I lost peace. This has been one of my biggest helpers in, 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 in my Christian walk. Uh, how, how, do you, how do you stay faithful? You know, at a young age, it, it's tough. Those of you that uh, were like me and became a Christian at a young age and tried to keep it through high school and keep it through college and then become a gospel preacher, you know, it's tough. Finding, finding a wife and things like that, it's difficult. Start studying with people. Start talking about it. It brings a lot more enjoyment, a lot more love from it, and, and you gain a lot personally. And once again, it's going back to that motive of just trying to help the lost and showing love. Uh, thank y'all for your attention.